Hey, welcome back to Transform Your Workplace. I am your host, Brandon Laws, as always. It's good to be back with you. What if you had somebody tell you that we shouldn't give feedback anymore? That's right. So the feedback you usually give to your employees, you know, in the 360 reviews, performance management, one-on-ones, or even try to seek feedback from your peers. What if somebody said, we're going to do this no more. It's not helpful. Well, that's what Carol Sanford says in her book, No More Feedback, Cultivate Consciousness at Work. Her book describes all about the reasons why feedback isn't that helpful and what we should be doing instead for our development. Again, if you're thinking, wow, this is ludicrous, there's no way that we could just forego giving feedback altogether, that's what I thought too. I, uh, but I told myself I'd go in open-minded to this conversation with Carol Sanford, and um, I love what she said. I think it's it's very unique stance on performance management, if you will, and I think there's something to be learned here. Uh, she she may be right. I don't know if I fully agree with not giving feedback feedback altogether because I think it is helpful, but I think uh, her points about it coming from within is really important. I want you to listen to this podcast with an open mind. I think it'll it'll push you to think differently. You don't have to agree, but I do want to know what you think. So uh, send me an email, follow up on LinkedIn with me, uh, tweet at me, uh, DM me on Instagram, wherever. But I do want to know what you think about this podcast. It's it's different. It's very contrarian, but I, I feel like we need to bring subjects like this to light so we can push ourselves to be better and to transform our workplace. Thank you for tuning in today. If you love this episode or even just liked it, please go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our podcast and give us a five-star review and a written review would be great. Please spread the word. Uh, Thank you so much for the support and enjoy the episode. Hey, Carol, it's so great to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thanks, Brandon. Glad to be here. You have such a fascinating book, uh, which I had a chance to read completely yesterday. It's called No More Feedback, Cultivate Consciousness at Work. And, you know, we were talking a little bit beforehand here, and you have what seems to be quite a contrarian view on feedback and whether it's helpful. I, I think most organizations are using feedback whether it's 360 reviews or anything like that. And I think most people would think feedback is good to enhance performance of their people. What do you believe? I believe that the intention people have when they feedback came about was a good one, which is they wanted to help people do the best job they could do, bring the best of themselves forward. But I believe they actually were working from a bit of an incomplete paradigm, I would call it, and therefore created um, ideas about how to develop people that's wrong. So let me say what I mean by that. In the, about a century ago, there was a guy named John Watson who created behavioralism. And it was based on the study of rats in a maze. So almost everything we do in HR right now is based on the work of John Watson and that rat maze. So if you manage rats, his work was really useful for you. But one of the major things that was a really went awry there is he believed that people could never, ever see themselves truly, that they could only see be seen by other people. We now know from tons of research that what other people see is probably less complete and that really it is not a fixed thing. It's a capability thing. So that's what I believe is you can build the capacity for people to see themselves and you can achieve more, which maybe we'll get to, than you ever could with trying to do it from the outside to impose on people. You had an interesting quote uh, early on in the book, page 10, I believe it is. And the quote says, in their earnest attempts to help me grow, my peers judged me against their own shortfalls and well-intentioned preconceptions, Uh, end quote there. And... I thought that illustrated, I think, what you believe about feedback pretty well is that when people are are giving feedback, they usually do it from their own lens and what they believe is their own shortfalls. Is that how you look at it as well? Uh, Not only me, the research shows that. And so Psychology Today did a big study 
on um, the effectiveness of feedback and how much it actually matched if you had a variety of different people looking. We always assumed 360, if everybody looked at it, you would get kind of a more full picture. But what the research showed is that there are so many biases built in that what was given to people was really a projection of what was in their own mind. And not only that, but it caused people to believe that that must be true because they had come to believe they couldn't see themselves. Now think how crazy that makes you. And the quote you just gave was how I got all caught up in feedback process when I was at San Jose State as a professor. When I first got there, and I, I was a pretty, always a pretty contrarian person, always questioning, done doing a doctorate in psychology. And I could feel that what people were telling me at that moment belonged to them. And believe it or not, I believed myself. And it sent me on a path. Okay, so you've got tons of stories in, in this book. Um, and I think a lot of those led up to why you probably believe what you believe in terms of feedback. There's probably things early on in your career. You mentioned a couple of stories when you were about 30 years old right. um, that happened. It maybe shed some light on how you came to this conclusion around why feedback isn't so helpful. I was in a program which was cross-departmental and we were creating something totally new. I brought Steve Jobs and Apple into it when they were a new company. Therefore, you know that I'm old, I'm not young. But in that process, I watched how people were structuring these competencies that they expected everyone to adhere to. And of course, the reason I say it's well-intentioned is you think, well, here are a certain set of things that might even be thought of as a baseline, but it becomes the top line. And you drive the entire organization. So it's bad for the business. You drive the entire organization toward a set of 15 to 30 same practices. And it gets the mind channeling all of its energy toward a set number of things. Now, what I could see is that I had skills, I had ability to see things, to work in a different way, which was really, really useful for people. And of course, I was 30 to 35 years old in that period. And so I wasn't without some questioning of myself. But it finally hit me that this was not the path. I ended up doing, um, on my doctoral research, studying a set of nine-year-old boys. And I think I have that story in the book. I've written so many books, I've lost track. <laughs> <laughs> but I looked at and discovered that if what we did, instead of giving those kids a set of things to perform at, asking them whether they felt like they did the exercise well, and when they, and by the way, these were all uh, identified compulsive liars in the school system. Wow. And when we asked them, they all said, yes, we did it perfectly. And of course, they didn't do the exercise that my team had given them. Uh, and so we showed them a video. Now, mm -hmm. that's feedback, right? And they first just disagreed with the video. And eventually, they wouldn't, after the third time, they wouldn't talk to us. We did a second control group where after the first set of exercises, we asked them um, how they did. They all said they were perfect because they were still compulsive liars. But then we said to them, how would you do it better next time? Now, I've learned that you need a lot more than that now, but for nine-year-old boys in this short, like couple of hour uh, uh, research, what we discovered was that the kids quit trying to convince us and they started trying to figure out how to make something really work. That turned me around and mm -hmm. I immediately started looking at all the other research I did. I became an educator. I left that program decided I wasn't going to be a full-time professor if that's what they were going to do. So I have been like at Babson College. I'm a senior fellow uh, of social innovation, and I ran a program at for executive education. And everywhere I go, I continually do the research, and I discover that there are alternatives. And that's what w this book is about, not just raking, although I give the history of feedback and all of the downside and all the research. What in the world do you do then if you don't do feedback? We'll talk about that. I'm so glad you brought up that experiment. I I read that and um, I I was actually quite amazed, and it, it actually changed my the way I was thinking about feedback. But I, I actually looked at it from a personal standpoint. I podcasting, for example, I often will ask people around me, "How am I doing? Like, what can I change?" And a lot of times they give me feedback that's important to them. You know, like we talked about their own shortfalls or you know, preconceptions or biases or whatever. But it wasn't like my development actually came from within, which is what really I think you're 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 coming from is I would listen to myself all the time and I would make slow tweaks and iterations based on what I'm doing, based on what I'm hearing. 
like how I want to improve. Is that really how you would kind of frame it up as well? That's a door. That's barely the beginning. So here <laughs> is what you uh, would do. Um, if you, the first, the thing is you have to know what you're going toward. Asking the question, how would I improve is like an abstraction in order yeah. to what? And that's where part of the flaw comes is I want you to be like me. I want you to be like somebody I like better because I don't like you. And so there is no reference point. So one of the things I point to in this book is what we're really trying to do is go toward three core human capacities being developed. Can I kind of outline those? I think that might help a little. Please, please do, because that was going to be my next question. <laughs> okay, we're on it then. Um, the first thing we want each of us to do is have full responsibility, accountability for our own behavior, our own choices. If you think about people you don't like, don't get along well with, have trouble with at work or home, or your kids, what you find is that it's usually related to at least partly that they don't take responsibility. They're a victim. They've got excuses. You know, it was all your fault. Didn't happen on my shift. Uh, and that makes organizations and relationships and parenting not work well. The second thing you want people to be able to do is to be connected to and have what I call external considering. So the first one is called locus of control, internal locus of control, which is a psychology term. External considering is a philosophy term. And it means I think about more than me. The world does not revolve around me. It is not all about me because if I've got internal considering, it's all about, oh my goodness, they're restructuring work. What's going to happen to me? Uh, am I going to be in trouble? When what you want people thinking about is how are we going to make this work for all of us? How are we going to make it work for our customers? That learning to do that external considering is what we want of all people. And the third one is we know that if people have agency, if they take initiative, if they take on bigger and bigger things over their life, and if they work on things that need doing that if nobody else does them, they won't get done, that's what we want, that personal agency that's sourced from something external. Now, the thing about feedback and the other 30 toxic practices I have in my last book, The Regenerative Business, and this is one of 30 books that's going to be about those, Feedback is one of the worst. And what it does is it undermines all three of those things. I, you're responsible for seeing me, not me. I, when I get feedback from somebody else, it works actually like a machine in my mind where it starts to shut me down and I start to worry about whether I'll be fired. And personal agency gets diminished because it looks like authority directives come from outside. So if, you're really wanting to have an organization that is working to build this powerful community of people who have full take full responsibility for their outcomes, for, for their considering an effect on others and having initiative. You don't want these 30 toxic practices. In talking about those three core human capacities, I imagine a lot of people focus on the external side, which is really the, the external of cons the scope of considering. Do you, do you believe that, like where people are mostly thinking externally instead of internally about their own development? Like what does somebody else want or how does somebody else yeah. see me? It's really true. Um, in each of these, there is a continuum. Mm -hmm. so the thing that I notice, and you can even look at politics, uh, people will divide around whether they believe Locus control is more important. Like, I want people to be responsible themselves, stand on their own two feet, not expect other people to take care of them. So that's sort of an extreme, uh, not unreasonable idea for people to have internal locus control. Me take responsibility. There's another group of people who will tend to push really hard on the external considering. So we should we should care more for others. We should build more empathy, more compassion, more ability to have higher degrees of philanthropy and take care of people. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get if you get pushed all the way on the side of that, you could easily move away from the internal locus of control. But if what you do is you have the one that's the extreme of everybody takes care of themselves, you lose caring about others. And you can see this in our political dialogue right now. So yes. this is just a business. This is a huge thing that we've instilled into our culture. You need those. You don't need a balance between them. You need an integration between them. You need to help every person. Like if you, if you did two nested circles, you need the inner 
piece of each person learning to be self-accountable, even if it's only for their response to something. And you need all of us to have external considering and have judgment to use that. And that's the kind of organizations I teach people to build is ones that have those integrated. Now, the funny thing is, the miraculous thing is, that is the sweet spot for agency. And because if I'm thinking about others and I'm going to take responsibility, now I'm not afraid. I step in and I have a way to make judgment. It was. It's interesting that you bring the, uh, up the integration because when I when I was reading the book and I'm, I I see the continuum of external internal for each of those those categories the control considering agency I I almost wanted to ask you is there like a perfect balance between them no. but I think you you illustrated it perfectly it's a, it's no you look at it in a, you integrate it there is internal and external but you need to you know take the right approach for each situation so i'm going to give you just a little bit of what i'd given an organization to learn to do that we are used to thinking everything is kind of flat flat land um but the world really is nested so if you were to draw three concentric rings one nested inside the other the outer ring connects us to that which we're seeking to make a difference for in the world. And that can be uh, customers, distributors, um, it could be uh, social justice, but it's on the bigger world stage. What do you want and what do you think is necessary in order to build a society that works, which the regenerative business the book just before this has as its overarching direction. Then you can come next to that um, middle inner circle, and there are many people doing it together. You're not the only one in the world. There, um, I'm working on a new book, The Non-Heroic Journey. There's a need to make things happen together, and there are ways you can design for people to collaborate, co-create, and then that can make that outer ring, the world we're working on, a lot easier to do and not us running into each other. The inner ring is... The person who is in the middle of all of that, me working on me, me developing me, me contributing to that outer world. And I call those three rings um, the way to develop people. It's not just action. I have to work on developing me to have those three human capacities. I have to work on developing that community in that middle ring. And I have to work on developing a society in the outer world. And that's how it becomes integrated is to see we are nested. That's what I mean by integration. On page 31, you posed a question that I think really illustrates what, you, what you're trying to describe in this entire book. So you posed a question that says, what if people could see themselves and their behavior so clearly that no feedback or other assistance was needed to guide them in their work? End quote. I, <laughs> I, lo I love that because like, how do we get to that where... As leaders, as managers, we could nudge people in the right direction to, to help see themselves better and for for development to come from within. How do we get how do right. we get there? So it's not a matter of nudging, it's a matter mm. of developing and educating you and yeah. restructuring work. We right now have structured work so that most of the ways we work with people is all externally managed. Uh, um, we even have things called supervisors. They have better vision than everybody else. I build uh, and I give people the capacity to redesign work systems, completely restructure it so that you have the ability of people to learn and to develop and to make promises. They make commitments. They reach out to do bigger things through a structured way of making that happen. Now, they do get other people helping them, but you don't ever give people, you don't have a structured feedback. You have personal development plans in a context of what the strategy is, in a context of what you're working on growing. And in that process, then you have something called resources, Rather than coaches, which are trying to, they, because coaches and managers all think they know better than the people. And it, it is a process of a series of stages to get people to have this capability. And one of them is initiating ways to make a contribution to something external to the business, to a particular market or customer or earth or community. That is the first step. And we usually do it in something called core teams or marketing field teams. 
where that marketing field team is connected to particular customers and they support each other in creating the new things that one or two or three of them organize around to do. And sometimes it's so big that it takes several years and they go back to school. In DuPont, I had people who became engineers who had only been line, uh, not only, it's a really important role, had been line <laughs> operators or, or people who were running TO2 lines or sodium cyanide lines. And they got so excited about what they saw was possible for a particular customer, somebody who was trying to do something like with paint with TIO2, that they committed and went back to school. DuPont paid for them to go back to school and they invented proprietary processes together. That You have to have that level of will built in to make the shift because you can't just say, let's just nudge people. Let's be better. Mm -hmm. You can't just be nicer. It is a literal rethinking. And I think as Rebecca Henderson, my friend who teaches at Harvard, she's a Harvard reports actually to the president of the university, she's so important, that she says what I'm doing is the business of the future. But I I now think I won't be alive to see it necessarily, but I've been doing it around the world in sections here and there for about 42 years. And I know it can work and I know we will get there. Let's go back to talking about feedback because I bet you there's listeners that are thinking feedback is is just core to our business like we yeah. provide feedback we're open and that's how people grow and develop you have a story and i think this is a great example of how feedback can really backfire uh, do you remember jerry the the manager yeah. yes oh, God, could, yes. could you tell that story because i thought it was a perfect illustration of somebody who's very effective where it, it just totally backfired yeah, Jerry was a supervisor, or for, I don't, I'm not sure he was, he was a lead, I think they might have called yeah, him in, yeah. uh, in Warehouser, and um, in their pulp uh, division. And I had been there about six months, and I knew they had this feedback kind of thing being introduced from corporate in parallel. And I had, I, what I do is I meet with people in education mode once a month with a team of people or every six weeks, uh, not a cascading way, but it, with a group of people involved from across the business. And I watched this Jerry who had the highest performance, his teams had the highest performance of anyone in the organization, but he was a little like me. He was a contrarian, but he always <laughs> did it from caring about yeah customers. He cared about other people and he would not let anything go by without questioning it because he wanted to make sure they were thinking well. He always said, I'm a rigorous thinker. And I said, and a precise one. He was always demanding precision. Well, 360 degree feedback came in. They had 12 competencies, one of which was go work with the team. And he got the first couple of rounds. It took about a year for it to wear him down. But people coming in and saying, you're just always questioning. You slow things down. You don't let things move. And of course, they didn't say it with the energy I've got in my voice. They always said it nicely. <laughs> uh, you know, we need you to be a better team player. Well, Jerry, like most of us in the world, thought other people must see something he couldn't see in himself and he should work on it. So he started trying like crazy to not disagree, to not argue. And I'm watching all of this happen. And I'm over here educating about how we need to. Uh, and I wasn't even talking about feedback or getting rid of it. I was talking about building the capacity of everybody to see themselves and lead. But slowly, Jerry stopped questioning. And the meetings became smooth. Everybody thought this was great. They didn't have Jerry slowing things down until they started having a series of fairly significant shortfalls in performance. And even Jerry's team, who had come to love this rigorous process because it was never personal, began to lose steam. And I came in one day and found that Jerry had quit. And he said, Gosh. you know, I'm so bad for this organization he left. Um, it took me several years to find him and get the story and know all the details of what went on. But even the the business unit leader of that group said, all right, we did something wrong here. That allowed me to really open the door and build this education mode where people will ask others for their reflection. So let's talk. Can we talk for a second about the difference between reflection and feedback? Of course. Yes, that'd be great. Yeah. So. Feedback works much like a mechanism on a machine that is to stop the overflow of hot oil or hot water or 
any number of things running over and, and there's a trigger mechanism that stops it. And that's the actual emotional effect that it has on people when they listen. No matter how hard you try and give them a way to learn to listen and be steady, you can't override the reptilian brain and you can't override the, the primate brain where we need to belong and are afraid of being ostracized. You can't. I, it, it's biologically built into us. Reflection, on the other hand, is each of these teams, when I help them set up or think about how to set up uh, a project they're going to take on, and they each individually are making huge promises to deliver, they set out first what they're going to be watching for. They go engage with people in advance. They say, do you think this makes sense about what I'm watching for? You got any ideas about how you would help me manage the effect it's going to have in the market and on earnings margin and cash flow, which I teach people to know how to count on every act they do every day. How does this lead to improve and evolving earnings margins and cash flow? Then as the process is moving along, you pull a group of people together who've agreed in advance to help you think about this and you bring to them what you're watching and seeing now they always ask for reflection but here's the difference feedback you come in certain you're seeing something and you want to make sure they see it reflection you come in seeing something you from your own experience think might be happening and you do your own work on yourself to say how much of this is projection how much of this is bias and i teach people to build that into the organization because if you don't do that you've got all and i think i list something like 10 of the biases i found in in mm -hmm. this book that if the person who is in the reflection spot, not the one who is driving the project, has to watch themselves first, which I also did another research project in, um, when I was working on my doctorate, that causes the person who is watching you and giving you their reflection to not be attached if they are certain. Not of any conviction that they're absolutely, it's like what they're saying. And then what they also say is, now I have a problem similar to that, or I'm working on this, so now, I'm building capacity for consciousness in me, the person who is going to talk to you, in you, the person who is going to receive it. And in that process, we build consciousness into the organization. But that, that requires a completely different work system. That's not a, a technique you can go use. It will not work. You have to build the capacity. So that's the difference. And I think it's a critical one. Yeah. And I think it's like, it's not even just a work system. I think people's frame of mind yeah. needs to change too. Like I, I, I'm a millennial and it, we get uh, a bad rap for always wanting feedback and, 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 you know. For, well, you've for, been conditioned by our culture and I'm so absolutely. sorry. Because I do believe millennials, I believe any new generation, which when they come into, and I I was a student in the middle of the war in Vietnam and the um, I was at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I marched, I got arrested. I mean, I, wow. I think that energy is so important, but I learned eventually that didn't change anything, but I got conditioned and you did too. Being and a millennial, people have told you, don't listen to them. Don't assume anybody is an expert on you and build organizations where no one is an expert on anyone else. How do we get rid of that conditioning? I mean, you, you obviously said that you know, self-governing is probably the most effective form of productivity and getting better. But how do people okay. like myself, individuals make a shift? It's not even just the the, the work uh, the, or the organization. Yeah, they could probably create um, an environment where that's effective, but people have to change too. Yeah. And that's why I say this work is about development and education. Mm -hmm. And the reason, and it takes um, a period of time because we do get our, our mental processes ingrained with a way of seeing the world. So I always start with having people learn to see different paradigms. Like there's the machine paradigm, which feedback comes from. There's the behavioral paradigm, which says people can't see themselves. There's the do good paradigm, which says, ah, I will do good for other people and then their lives will be better. Now there's so much arrogance in that. And sometimes <laughs> we're right, but there is also the colonizing effect that we've had. Only a developmental mind, which believes people, that paradigm, believes that people can learn to see themselves, but it will take educating, reading. I write tons of papers available in the public market about, I publish on Medium, on LinkedIn. I've written tons of books. I do three podcasts, all of which are trying to question this because you reading the book last night already got you asking questions and mm -hmm. it won't work for everybody. But now you have to stay on top of that. You have to keep asking, what are the other paradigms? How can I learn to see them in me? How can I catch me? Um, and then I run 
programs for individuals to come that are just education programs online. That process is really important to building the capacity of people to be able to see themselves and to unwind the conditioning they have. Uh, and you do need to be in a community. You can't do it mm -hmm. standing all by yourself. The world, the pressures are too strong. So I build business communities, business owners, leaders. I mean, I have Google in those. I have Microsoft in them. I, but they're always a leader out of a company and their team. Um, so get in a community. And I think even at the end of this book, I give you a path, right? I meant to. Uh, that laid out the five major things that you need to do, which was, you know, working on your own reflection, learning to use different frameworks or paradigms, get into developmental engagements when you're where you're growing, and join a community of people mm -hmm. who are working this way. One thing that when I was reading the book came through loud and clear, I think it was towards the back half of the book, you really just start talking about the Socratic method of questioning um, in, in, as a way to avoid giving feedback. And I kind of looked at that and I'm like, okay, as a manager and leader, asking questions is uh, is a great method and not only uh, with other people but internally as well uh, do you do you like that method for even just being self-aware and self-developing like just asking yourself questions and how do you recommend people use that that's how i write everything i i see something that doesn't make sense to me uh, like that's what happened with feedback. I keep looking, I say, why doesn't this make sense? Why does this not feel whole? Uh, so I do believe this is true, but I do believe you can paradigmatically send Socratic method in the wrong direction, especially with other people. And I think this could happen with you too, which is you have an answer you want people to come up with and you ask a question. You say, I'm not going to tell them, I'm going to ask. But the problem is that if you aren't open to the evolution of the answer, then you're back in the old paradigm that got us into feedback. You're giving them feedback in a more sophisticated way. The second thing you have to have, and you, this is true for you alone also, is you have to move from using mental models that are in your head that program you and you can't see them to using frameworks, which I introduce a great deal in the book. I introduce it. It's one of the most powerful instruments in the world is it gives you a sustained way to look at something and ask questions because if we just ask ourselves questions it's like oh, I'll ask myself some questions we are using the mind that created the problem that caused us to see this way to try and ask the new question you have to re-educate and learn to watch the mind that's been conditioned to this external view of others know better than you and others research. I did a podcast on my business second opinion that showed how dangerous research is and how it is from different paradigms. So it isn't just a matter of going to questions. That's appreciative learning. I mean, there are tons of people who do that, but if they do it with the mind that got us where we are, which is the John Watson mind or the machine mind, or even the do good mind, then it, that is just a technique now and it doesn't move anything. Sorry. No, this is great. And, and now that we got people's heads spinning, where could they learn more about your work? Because there's so much more to unpack here. We didn't even touch on everything, but we, we do have to go. Uh, where, where can people find more about this book, your other books, or any other work that you're doing that you want to point people to? So carolsanford.com is my personal website from which off of which I spend speaking and so forth. And I've got a podcast on there called Business Second Opinion, which is me being the person who does most of the talking. I have a co-host who engages with me. This is critiquing Harvard Business Review one article at a time from its paradigm, from its history, how it's making a mess of what we're doing to human beings and in business. I have Carol Sanford Institute, which has much more of my business offerings and case stories of everything from Google to DuPont to Colgate Palmolive to small businesses like Seventh Generation. Uh, and I am perfectly happy for people to email me at carol at carolsanford.com uh, if there's something specific they're trying to find. I do have four books, all of which have won major awards. This is the fourth one. Um, and so you can find those on carolsanford.com. And I'll have a new one, uh, The Regenerative Human, which is for individuals, in nine major roles that if they were played with the new paradigm, it would change society. And I have a book project. So I'd be glad to have people potentially get involved in the project and become a story that's in the book. That should give people enough ways to find me. Carol Sanford, it has been a pleasure speaking with you today. Well, Brandon, you keep making the changes in the world you are. I'm counting on you as the generation which will make a difference. 
Thank you so much for joining us today for the conversation with Carol Sanford. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation I had with her. If you like this episode and you want to get more just like it, make sure to go to your favorite podcast app and hit subscribe so you get our weekly episodes as they release. If you'd like to connect with me or reach out on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram, and I'd love to connect with you and keep the conversation going. Talk to you next week.